So welcome to College Algebra. Uh, Today is what? 19th. The 19th. So last time, last time uh, we were talking about uh, complex numbers. So uh, let's do an example. So how about 4 minus 3i multiplied by um, 2 plus 5i. So how do you carry this out? Foil, yeah? <clears throat> OK, so 8 uh, plus 20i minus 6i, and then minus 15 I squared. So, so far everything's normal in a sense, but what, how does this start to differ from FOIL? Yeah? Right. So, I, I represents the unit imaginary number. It's the number that when you square it, you get negative 1. Okay. So this would be 8 plus 20i minus 6i, and then minus 15 multiplied by negative 1. Because i squared is negative 1. OK. So then subtracting, subtracting 15i squared is the same as adding 15. OK, so then 8 plus 15, that's what? 23. 23. <coughs> and then um, plus 14i. Interesting. Any question about this one? OK. So how about, how about 4 minus 3i? And then let's divide by 2 plus 5i. So it's the, same, it's the same complex numbers as the previous exercise, except instead of product, we have quotient. Yes? Um, on the last one, why do we not plug a negative 1 for the other i? Oh, because it's i squared. Okay. Right. <clears throat> by the way, in a classroom, that, that kind of exchange happens all the time. It happens all the time because the way your brain is, it's actually separated into different um, units. And they don't always talk to each other so well. And so the, the psychological assumption of what happens there is that when student has a question, there's a question in some part of the brain. And then when you, when you take the effort to, to speak it out, then it goes back into your ear into the oral processing part of your brain, and now you have multiple parts of your brain engaged. And then very frequently, student says, oh, never mind. <laughs> because, because that engages enough of your brain, which is why your instructors will usually say, if you ask them a question, they'll say, can you write down what it is that you're trying to ask me? And the reason is because if you write down what you're trying to ask, then it goes into your eyes, back into your visual cortex, which is the most computationally powerful part of your brain. And then frequently student says, oh, never mind. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> that's also why, that's also why all, most of your instructors, and especially your math instructors, are always, always saying, please show your work. Okay, you should know that the way you work as a machine the more engaged the various parts of your brains your brains are the more likely you'll be able to have en bring enough to bear against the problem okay rant over so then <clears throat> the trick here is that we're going to take the number the, the expression that we were given and we're going to multiply by what's the only thing we can multiply by and not change it 1. So we need to multiply by 1. 
Okay, but now we're going to be a little bit clever about how we're going to write that one. So I'm going to replace this red one with another red expression. And as long as it's equivalent to one, then it will be a legitimate thing to have done. So 4 minus 3i over 2 plus 5i. OK, and what are we going to replace that red one with? Not quite. OK, right. So what, what we'll need, this is a 2 plus 5i. For, for reasons that are not, maybe not clear yet, we're going to need a 2 minus 5i down here. We're going to need a 2 minus 5i. But we can't just put a 2 minus 5i down there and just leave it, because that would be equivalent to dividing by something that's not 1. So to make it right, what else do we need? We also need it up top. So does everybody see that this thing that I wrote in, in red is 1? OK. So now, it's not clear why we did this, but let's just do it and see what happens. So I'm going to foil the numerator and also the denominator. So in the numerator, that would be uh, 8 minus 20i minus 6i, and then plus 15i squared. Any question about obtaining that numerator? <coughs> OK, then the denominator, that would be 4 minus 10i plus 10i, and then minus 25i squared. Any question about, about foiling out the denominator? So now we have to play the i squared is negative 1 game. So everywhere that you see i squared, that means negative 1. So in the numerator, that would be 8 minus 26i and then minus 15. And then de the denominator is where the notable thing occurs. So this 4 is just a 4. What happens to the terms in the middle? They cancel so that there's no more, there's no more i to 1s. And then we have this uh, negative 25i squared, so that's plus 25. So what notable thing has occurred in the denominator? There's no more imaginary part. It's completely real. It's 29. So the numerator will be uh, what? Negative 7 minus 26i. And then the denominator is 29. So what's important here is that the denominator is real. It has no imaginary part. And that means that now we can divide this denominator in and say, say it like this. So this is negative 7 over 29, and then minus 26 over 29i. Interesting. So by the way, so we had this denominator 2 plus 5i, and we said that we, for some reason, for some reason we wanted to multiply by 2 minus 5i. What was that reason? this one right here, so that the denominator would be, would be real. How are two, 2 plus 5i and 2 minus 5i are said to be blank to each other? I'm fishing for a C word. Conjugate. conjugate. They're conjugate to each other. They're conjugate to each other. So now, that's interesting. So with complex numbers, the product of conjugates is always real is always real. In the end, that's the reason why, we're, why we did this. For those of you who like a, a, a geometric reason, 
better. Uh, the reason for it is this. So imagine that here's a doorway. So it's a doorway or a hallway, if you like. And I want you to imagine that you're walking out here in, in an open space and you're carrying a ladder sideways and you're trying to, you're trying to get to the other part of the room. So dunk, dunk, dunk. You can't make it, right? So I guess it's just impossible to, to get a ladder to go through a hallway, huh? It's, it's impossible. It's just literally impossible. Right. No, no. So, so, so what you do is you first, okay, I'll turn it this way, go through the hallway, and then turn it back to the way I want it. Right? So then, like this, turn, proceed, turn. Okay? Turn it back. Right? So, so, turn to the right. Oh, wait. No, I'm like this. Turn to the, to the left. Turn it back to the right. That's literally what this is doing. When you put this, when you divide by 2 minus 5i, it's taking a complex number that is, that is somewhere on the complex plane and it's turning it to where it's on the real line, the real part of the complex plane. So, so like in our, in our story like this, so that you can go through and then turn it back. Okay, interesting. Any question about dividing complex numbers? Okay. <coughs> Another matter of definition is, no, you know what? First off, I'm going to make a remark. Let x be real. My first question. Can negative x, can negative x be negative? Yes. Okay. Okay, my second question. Can negative x be positive? Yes. Now, there's a little, most students at, at this point in position in college algebra have a little bit of cog cognitive strain here. Can negative x be negative? Sure it can. What if x is negative 10? Negative negative 10 is 10. Can negative x be, be positive? Sure. Can negative x be negative? Yes. Sure. Can negative x be neither one of these? In theory. Not in theory. What if x is 0? Then negative 0 is 0, which is neither positive nor negative. So the fact that you see this negation d doesn't tell you anything about the SIGN of the expression negative x. Because if x is positive, then negative x is negative. But if x is negative, then negative x is positive. Lots of, <laughs> lots of language floating around there. Okay. Okay. So now we have a definition. Let a be a positive real. then the definition of the square root of negative a so now because a is positive because a is a positive real that means that negative a really is negative okay. the definition of this is the square root of a i so you can think of it like like the negative one comes out of the radical as, as an i okay and your book you often, or maybe always, writes it like this, i square root a. 
but I find that kind of weird uh, to do that, so I won't do that. Uh, however, the reason why your book does that, the reason why your book does that is because you want to avoid the, the following ambiguity. Something like the square root of 5 i. So that's a little bit ambiguous, right, if I even make it a little worse. Why is that a little bit ambiguous? It looks like it's the square root of i. Right, it, look, it looks as if I may be inside the radical. It's not clear. So that's why when I write, write something on the, on the right side of the radical, I put a little serif on my radical so that you know that that's the end. Okay, so that being the case, would you please compute uh, the square root of mm, negative 13? Okay, well, this is equal to, according to the definition above, the square root of 13 i. Okay, any question about that one? <clears throat> okay, sorry? That's it. Uh, how about the square root of negative 16, like this? Then what? Well, according to the definition, it would be square root of 16, i, and then you can do better than square root of 16. What is the square root of 16? 4. So the answer is 4i. Okay, how about what's the square root of um, 9? Three, right? All the stuff that you knew before this page still exists. I'm sorry? No. There's only one square root of every number. Now there's a different, it's a different matter to say, to, to observe that three, on the one hand, three squared is nine, that's true. And on the other hand, negative three all squared is also nine but three is the only square root of nine. Yes? I have two questions. On the left side, will it be square root a i or i square root a? And then if we add a square root of seven, would be four i or i four? On WebAssign, four i should be fine. Okay. Now, if you, on WebAssign, now this is a separate matter. If you want to write, if you wanted to write this on WebAssign, then to get it to be done, to, to get WebAssign to agree with that, you'd have to write something like this, S, Q, R, T, and then parentheses 13, and then close the parentheses, and then I. Okay, or put the I in front. Or you can just do the clicky thing, click, 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 and, you know, all that. Okay, how about, how about square root negative 9. 3i. <clears throat> Any question about this? Yes? Just square root 13i, yeah, just like this. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, so now, when we started the complex section, we considered an equation like this. Not exactly this one, but one like this one. So how about x squared plus 25 is equal to zero? We considered this equation. 
Okay, I'd like to note that this equation is equivalent to x squared is negative 25. Moving that 25 to the other side. So could you please tell me about the reals that square to negative 25? There aren't any, right? So what if, what if you have a positive real and you square it? It would be positive. What if, so, it, so, it could, so x could not be a positive real. OK, let's try a negative real. What if you square a negative real? Still positive. Okay, so x couldn't be a negative real. Are there any other are there any other reals? There's zero. There's zero. Okay, how about zero squared? Zero. <laughs> okay, it's not negative twenty five. So does everyone agree that okay, it's there is no real x to satisfy this. But now, now we can compute the square root of both sides. So the square root of x squared is the square root of negative 25. Okay, and according to the previous page, we can pr we can take the right hand side further. So, what is the square root of negative 25? What is it? Five i. And now, to your question about what is the square root of nine. Here's where students usually make a mistake. You, and it's often because high school instructors don't make the proper distinction. What is the square root of, neg of, of x squared? It's not x. It's the absolute value of x. So most, most students walk into college algebra having been trained that the square root of x squared is x. From their, from their secondary school. But that is, in fact, not correct. The square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. Okay, which means that, so now I want you to imagine. Suppose, w let me ask it like this. What could you put into an absolute value so that 7 would come out? You could put 7 in or negative 7. So what could you put in to an absolute value so that 5i would come out? Well, you could put 5i in or negative 5i. So the answer is x is negative 5i or x is 5i. And what happens in secondary school is your secondary school instructors try and try and more or less merge these three lines together into a single line and say plus or minus something or other and it causes no end of confusion among students who try and take school take math courses at university where it starts to distinguish distinguishing those lines becomes important okay so now let's check and see if this really is a solution so let's check so Check has a has a K in it. Okay, so specifically, what I want you to do is I want you to take. We don't write A. I'm sorry. How would we know? We don't write A. <laughs> right, exactly. So what I but one day, right? Uh, so I want you to take this solution, and, and I want you to plug it into this equation. So we're going to replace this x with what? 25 i squared. Well, yes, but I'm going to do it just slightly slower. <laughs> so I'm going to replace it with negative 5i, and then we're going to square that. OK, now the square distributes to the various pieces. So then we'll have negative 5 squared, and then i squared, and then plus 25 is 0. Okay, how about negative 5 squared? What is that? 25. 25. 
And then how about I squared? What's that? Negative 1. And then plus 25 equals 0. So how about the left-hand side? Negative 25 plus 25. So it's 0 equal to 0. So does that, equa does that equation evaluate true? Yeah. It sure does. That's why negative 5i is a solution. You can also see that 5i would have been a solution because instead of squaring negative 5, we'd be squaring 5. And in either case, we're going to get 25. And that looks like an oxygen molecule. <laughs> right? So any questions about this one? Yes? Just um, with the absolute value of x, mm -hmm. I thought absolute value couldn't be negative. Right. The things that come out of the absolute value have to be non-negative. But here, here's a separate question. It has to do, let me, let me write it down. <clears throat> Suppose that we're considering this now. What, what x's could you put in so that 7 would come out? So you could put 7 in, or you could put negative 7 in. So, so x is negative 7, or x is 7. Okay. So it's absolute value, because even if you put a negative in, it will come out. Yeah, the absolute value squashes the negative. Yeah. So it's not that the absolute value of something is, is negative, mm -hmm. it's that what, what you could put into the absolute value so that that would come out could be negative. Okay. Other questions? OK. <clears throat> so um, now we're in section, the next section, whatever it is, 2, 5, I think. It's called quadratic equations. So we've done a little bit of them, but now we're going to do all of them. So the first uh, remark, which is part of the axioms of the reals, is that let A and B uh, be in the reals. Then this statement, AB, A product B, equal to 0. So if this statement is true, that implies that either A was 0 or B was 0. Now, we've used this statement before, but now I'm writing, down, writing it down for you formally. It is to say that if you have a product of real numbers and that product is 0, it must be the case that at least one of the factors was 0. So let's see it in an example so that you know what I'm talking about. So uh, how about x squared plus 14x uh, plus 24 equal to 0? Okay. So we want to solve this. How are we going to solve it? What do you think? Okay, let's factor it. So can you think of two numbers whose product is 24 and whose sum is 14? Okay. So then we could write this as x plus 12 multiplied by x plus 2. So now, who can tell me the solutions to this equation? Or who can tell me one of the solutions? Zero. Okay. Negative 12 is one of the solutions. Why is negative 12 a solution? Because in that case you would have negative 12 plus 12 times negative 12 plus 2. Negative 12 plus 12 is 0, and one of the factors must be 0 for g equals 0. Right. So if you plug in negative 12 here, this factor is 0. This one is not 0. But that doesn't make any difference, because it's being multiplied by this one, which is 0. So we have a product of things equal to 0. So it must be the case that either the first factor is 0 or the second factor is 0. 
So that's what this is saying. That's the reason why that works. So now this is x is negative 12 or x is negative 2. Any question about this one? <clears throat> so this single equation branches in, into two equations. Right? Okay, so how about this one? x squared uh, minus 16 is equal to 0. Okay. So now, I imagine that a large group of you, maybe even every single one of you, without writing down any work whatsoever, can tell me what the solutions are. So what are they? Yeah, negative 4 and also positive 4. Now, if you just write those down, you won't get credit. Because what I want to see is I want, I want to see you come to this conclusion. Okay? Because not, it, it is almost irrelevant that the solutions are negative 4 and 4, almost. What's being graded is, is the process by which you get there. So here's two legitimate processes to get there. So on the one hand, you could factor this. How does, how does it factor? Right. x plus 4 multiplied by x minus 4. And then from here, it's clear enough that, OK, yeah, what are the solutions? Good. And I wrote, I wrote them negative 4 and then 4 because I have a I have a habit, as, as often as possible, to write the solutions in increasing order. <laughs> Subconscious habit. Okay, so then another, th this, this would be totally legitimate, but if you just write this, if you just write that, then you won't get full credit. Okay? You have to write something intermediate. Okay? If you don't like that, then you could just altogether differently say, okay, well, I'm going to look at it like this x squared is 16, and I'm com going to compute the square root of both sides. Yes, so that absolute x is 4, and now the question is, is what, could you p what x could you put into the absolute value so that 4 would come out? 4 and 4. Yes. One of the two one of the two branches is what's necessary to get credit. And I agree entirely that at the outset, it's obvious, obviously 4 and negative 4. Okay. Any question about this? So the absolute value of 4 is the same response as x equals negative 4 over 4? No. So, so you either need to, from here, you, it's a flow chart, right? From here, you can say, well, I factored it, and so the solutions are those. Mm -hmm. Or you can say, okay, well, I'm going to do that, move the 16 over, and then I square root both sides and arrive at absolute value of x must be 4. And if the absolute value of x must be 4, it must be the case that x is negative 4 or x is 4. Okay, so what if it's slightly more... Um, entertaining, something like, something like, uh, 4x squared plus 15x uh, plus 9 is equal to 0. So what makes us sad about this one? It's not monic. It's not monic. By the way, what is monic? Uh, right, the leading coefficient is 1. That's what it means to be monic. What is the leading coefficient here? 4. Four. So sad. Okay, so then, 
that means it just requires a little bit more work. So you take the first, the product of the first and last coefficients, which is 36, and we want to factor this so that the sum of those factors is what? 15. Is 15. A factorization of 36 whose sum is 15. Okay. So how about 1 and 36? No. No. How about 2 and 18? No. no. How about 3 and 12? Yeah. Oh, we found it. Happy day. Okay, so then we found, we found two, two numbers whose product is 36 and whose sum is 15. What do we do with these? Very good. So 4x squared, and then plus, what we're going to do is we're going to split this 15 into parts. We're going to say that we're going to take 3 of them first, and then 12 of them. So plus, or the other way, or 12 of them first, and then 3 of them. It doesn't matter. So 4x squared plus 3x plus 12x plus 9 is 0. So does everyone see that the purpose of this table above, this procedure, was to split the 15x into 3x plus 12x. That was the entire purpose. So what do we do with this now? Nice. Yes. So we're going to form groups. So what are we going to do with this group? Take out an x, because that's the greatest common factor in this group. So an x could come out. And if we pulled an x out, then what would remain in here? Very good. OK, and then what's the greatest common factor in here? 3. And if we pull out a 3, then what remains? 4x plus 3. So now I'm feeling pretty good about this. I, I have confidence that, that I've probably done this right. Why do I have con confidence that I've probably done this right? Because they match. Because they match, right? Here we have a 4x plus 3, and here we have a 4x plus 3. So it, it showed up both times. So if this was 4x plus 3 and this was 4x plus 5, that would indicate to you that something didn't go right. Something didn't go right. OK, so now what I want you to see is that 4x plus 3 is common to this, to this term and also that term, which means that it should be possible to factor 4x plus 3 out. And my question to you is, is what goes in here if you do that? Right. So this x goes in there, and this 3 goes in there, and that plus goes in there. Yes? What happens if like, you get the same, well, I guess not the same, but you get the same like numbers, but it was like 4x plus 3 and then 4x minus 3. Is that they, they must be identical. 4x plus 3 is not the same as 4x minus 3. <coughs> so if, if, if you got 4x plus 3 here and 4x minus 3 here, that, that means that you made an error somewhere. Okay. And do they have to be in like specific order? Like when you're adding the plus 3x and the plus 12x? Could, could you have done it reversed is, is your question, I think? It, it, you can do it reversed and it must not matter. You must get the same. And you should check it in your own time, right? So if, if you happen to have done it in this order with me, then later for study, do it in the other order and make sure that, that you get the same thing. Okay. So have we answered the question? No. <laughs> so what are we supposed to do now? Right. 
So what we have now is we have a product of things is zero. So it must be the case that the first thing is zero or the second thing is zero. So as a result of this, it must be the case that x plus 3 is zero or 4x plus 3 is zero. And so now we can solve these equations individually. So the first one is easy enough, I'll do it. So x is negative 3, or the second one is slightly more complicated, or what? Um, x is negative 3 over 4. Right, and I'll do it in two steps. So 4x is negative 3, and then divide by 4. Very good. Any question about this? Okay. So now, let's do another one. How about x squared minus 6x minus 13 is equal to 0? So it's monic, that makes us happy. <laughs> but what? Right. So, so can you think of two numbers whose product is negative 13 and whose sum is negative 6? Probably not off the top of your head. <laughs> so there aren't any integers that'll do it. There aren't any rational numbers that'll do it either. So something like 37 over 4 would, would not work. Okay, so does everybody see that, okay, the methods that we have until now um, don't cover this. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an arcane procedure. So, so, but I'll note that the product sum trick Product sum trick, there's no joy. So we'll have to do something else. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the terms that have x, I'm going to leave them on the left-hand side. I'm going to take all the terms that don't have x, I'm going to move them to the other side. Now, at the beginning of the class, to perform the division of complex numbers, to perform the division of complex numbers, what we did is we multiplied by 1. But it was sort of like clever, like, oh, wow. <laughs> it's 1, but it's really convenient to write it in that conjugate representation. So instead of we're not going to multiply by 1, we're going to add something. What's the only thing we can add? Zero. We're going to add zero. But we're going to be really clever about it. We're going to be as clever as we can. So x squared minus 6x. And what we're going to do is we're going to add something over 2, and we're going to square it. Now, I haven't said the something yet. I'm going to put something in the numerator in a moment. But if we add this much, what else must we do? Subtract. Must subtract this, that, that much also. And so do you see that, okay, that's zero. So x squared minus 6x and then plus this much over 2 minus this much over 2. Equal 13. And the question is, is what goes, what goes in those numerators? This goes in the numerators, this coefficient. So negative 6. 
Okay. Now, I haven't explained why. Right now, it's just I'm just pulling rabbits out of hats. So negative 6 over 2, what is that? Negative 3, square that, what is that? 9. So for some reason, I'm saying that it, it's, it, was, it was in our good interest that we're going to add 9 and then subtract 9. Now, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> OK. Now, we could not factor the quadratic we were given in the first place. Couldn't factor it. But now here we have a new quadratic. And it factors in the nicest way possible. How do these first three terms factor? times x minus 3. They factor as a square. So that is to say that this is x minus 3 squared. And then this is minus 9. And this is 13. Now I'm going to move that 9 over to the other side. So what's the right hand side? 22. OK. Now what? I want to get that x by itself. It's inside of a square. How do I get it out? Square roots. About two more lines and we'll be finished. So what is the square root of x minus 3 squared? X minus 3. No. Absolute value of x minus 3. Thank you. Absolute value of x minus 3. And so now, I have a question. Ignoring what's inside of the absolute value for a minute, just pinky, right? What could you put inside of the absolute value so that square root 22 would come out? Yeah, you could put, you could put <laughs> square root 22. That would work. Negative square root 22 would also work. So that means that what's inside of the absolute value? x minus 3 must be negative square root 22. Or x minus 3 must be the square root of 22. And then now we can solve for x. So x is 3 minus the square root of 22, or <coughs> x is 3 plus the square root of 22. And so now back to the top, can you think of two numbers whose product is negative 13 and whose sum is negative 6? Those numbers are? negative 3 minus the square root of 22 and negative 3 plus the square root of 22. Two numbers whose product is that one and whose sum is that one. And so the last thing I want to say is, isn't this really boring and technical? Yes. Wouldn't it be great if we just had some little machine to where we didn't have to write all this down? Yes. We'll do that on Wednesday without a calculator.